Anjarao, and this is uh, our presentation uh, from SNAP Karate and CMAP Health. Welcome to the participant. Um, the participants. Uh, I'm glad that even in the short notice, uh, many of you have registered and shown interest. And I hope this will be a worthwhile and useful presentation for you. Uh, so I'm going to just switch on my slides to get the presentation going. So I'd like to thank uh, Snap Clarity, uh, who's providing us with excellent IT support as we are streaming this presentation, and my colleague, Bonnie Kuehl, who's watching all your comments in the background. And hopefully, you'll be able to get some answers for your comments. I'm just going to quickly check the presentation is on. Okay. So surviving the crisis is our presentation for the current ongoing situation that we have globally. Uh, it probably doesn't require any further description. So without much further ado, I'll launch into the presentation. The two of us are presenters and Bonnie Kuhl is uh, looking into your questions and comments in the background. Um, I suggest that we take the questions at the end. You can keep sending your questions, but we'll answer them in the end to keep the flow of the presentation. Uh, I'd also like to say that there are a lot of things being covered in this presentation. Uh, and if you feel uh, there's too much information uh, to handle out of the, uh, at the same time, you can always go back and view our videos which will be posted in our uh, various sites at SNAP Clarity and CMAP Health. So what we want to share this evening are not just a few tips uh, and uh, tricks. What we really want to share with you is, is a conceptualization of how to deal with the situation uh, because as much as coronavirus is a physical health crisis, it's also a mental health crisis. And we have already started seeing people struggling with their mental health, and we're seeing presentations in the emergency room, uh, across our outpatient departments, and also in the community. And if people are watching this from other parts of the world, outside of Canada, North America, this will not be a dissimilar uh, scenario for you. This is one of the times that, where we are actually fairly united in our experiences of this crisis, mentally and physically. So there is a crisis, absolutely. And what's really paradoxical is that this is the first time which people will remember in decades that we are actually interconnected as a, the entire world uh, in this crisis. So this is our brief classification of this crisis from health perspective. So there's a large amount of general stress affecting well-being of uh, people all across the world. And then there are those people who are suffering from mental health conditions, and there may be exacerbation of their situation just now. And then those people who are actually made, who have actually made good recovery from their mental health conditions, but are at a risk of relapse. And as we actually work with our mental health system, we are trying to monitor how best we can serve these three different groups of people. Interestingly, across the world, it doesn't, does not matter which country you live in and how developed the country's health services are. Generally, mental health services have been underfunded. Uh, but the positive part of all this is there's a paradoxical increase in access to services in general, health services in general, and mental health services in particular. There have been many occasions in the past a few days to few weeks where I've directly streamed into many of our clients' homed, homes and provided consultations. Um, in fact, last weekend when I was on call, I could uh, help one of the clients to actually have the consultation from home rather than come to the emergency room for her mental health problem. 
So being informed is really important. Uh, across the world, the governments are trying to flatten the curve of the of viral uh, load, which is uh, going across the community. And we are all together in this. And anything that we are doing today, tomorrow, is to flatten this curve so that we can prevent the people who are more frail and more susceptible to infections uh, from getting unwell. So our job is to cooperate and survive. And this is the definition of resilience, which is not just individual, but across the world and global. So there is a lot of advice out there. And many of the things uh, we are going to say has already been covered in various forums. I have no doubts about it. Uh, what we want to do is give you some useful pieces of information which you can apply even as things keep changing because data keeps changing, facts keep changing, the spread of virus keeps changing. And in those changing circumstances, as the governments change what they're doing about this, we want to have some sort of template to survive these changes. So we actually reviewed lots of papers and this was part of uh, other studies that we've been doing. And we found that the single most important predictor of success in life or a predictor of our ability to manage things is actually our belief, faith, and confidence in the fact that we can take action. So it's actually not even the ability, but the belief in one's ability. Scientists call this self-efficacy. Well, let's learn from our recent history. So this is Dr. Viktor Frankl. Dr. Frankl was a psychiatrist and he was in one of the Nazi concentration camps, actually maybe in perhaps more than one of the uh, concentration camps. Um, Dr. Frankel managed to survive the camps, many perished, and Dr. Frankel took upon himself to tell us how we can survive this adversity. And in my mind, that is probably the best example of uh, resilience. So what was his secret? His secret was very simple. In managing his suffering and adversity, he had to find a personal meaning in it. And that has been the most important message of surviving adversity to us from our history. He coined the term logotherapy and devised a, a style of therapy whilst he was in the concentration camps uh, based on the fact that we can survive all suffering if we can give a personal meaning to this. And he uses the term will to meaning, uh, which actually indicates that even, at the, even when something as meaningless as being persecuted in the way people were being in the concentration camps, there is a possibility of finding meaning in that suffering and one has to find meaning in that suffering. So before the how, what Dr. Frankel really emphasizes is why. So why should we survive this suffering? That's really important from his perspective. So he defines three ways of finding purpose, doing something, which is an action or a deed, uh, which one finds meaningful. So for instance, you might find meaning in the simple act of perhaps writing a journal, exercising, meeting people, Many of these things may be simple acts, but may be deeply meaningful to you. Focusing on the experience of the person. So Dr. Frankel realized that some of the things that we do, uh, even something simple as listening to music, some experience that you can have during the day might itself be very meaningful. He had a strong emphasis of fo on focusing on person. So meaning should not just be a private affair, but must involve people around us as well. And eventually, even in the most indescribable suffering, he felt that meaning could be found. So we don't have a lot of time, but this is a good place where you should make note and think in the current situation that we are finding ourselves, is there something which strikes you, uh, however small or big, as meaningful to you personally and to people around you as well? So, Without the why, nothing would make sense. So we're getting a lot of advice about sleep, diet, routines, connecting with people. 
but what is the why behind that? And we have to take the opportunity to answer that question for ourselves uh, to then make sense of all the tips and techniques and good advice that is coming across to us. So let's rethink the idea of stress, which is, has a very negative connotation in today's society. Uh, we could probably do another talk on this, but stress is not all bad. Stress also helps us uh, find uh, solutions to the problems that we are facing. It can motivate us. So finding meaning in stress is really important. So we have a number of challenges before us. And all of this has come quite suddenly to people all across the world. Uh, so what is it that's important in these challenges for us? And as I mentioned earlier, this is a personal question, but also a societal and perhaps even a political question. So having asked the question why and why is the meaning behind it all, the next question is who? So who is the person asking this question? And here's how we define it. The person in this situation is a person who brings in their own unique strengths and resources. So it would be important to ask yourself, what is driving you right now? And what are the resources around you? Because you're not alone in this, there are people around you. This is another really important quote from Dr. Franco. Everything can be taken, taken away from a man, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances and to choose one own, one's own way. It's interesting when I recall the time I read this book, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Frankel was in the concentration camp, and I think he was stripped bare. He was trying to write a book. His manuscripts were taken away. And I think he frames this question around that time that even when you're possessing of nothing, attitude makes a big difference. And he actually wrote on scraps of paper um, here and there to write his magnum opus man's search for meaning. So there are two components to this survival attitude. We've already talked about the meaning, but also the belief in oneself to take action. So we started with why, we started with who, you and the people around you. And now we're entering into the much more refined definition of what. So in, very often in defining problems, we have a very big abstract definition of the problem, like finances, children, health. And overall, in terms of successful problem solving, it's good to be specific. And here are some examples that I've outlined how to be specific. But even though we might be faced with the same problem, it may not affect us in the same way. Uh, often people say we are on the same boat, but in fact, we are on the same ocean, but we might be driving our own different boats. So moving from problem to solutions. One way we've approached this when uh, we have been coaching people uh, in our research projects is to help them identify the top three, four, five problems. As often in a state of worry, people identify too many problems and feel very fatigued when they're trying to address them. Identifying the top two to three would help you become focused and work on them more effectively. So maintaining our momentum of this discussion from why to how to what, we're not gonna look at how to break problems down and choose solutions. There are really two major ways of breaking things down. If the problem is very big, break it down. If you are worried about your finances, break it down to the budget for the week or for the month. If you are uh, working on the same problem as finances, look at multiple solutions. Should you be speaking to your bank? Are there people who can help you? Do you have savings uh, which you can rely on? So these are examples of breaking the problem down or listing multiple solutions. So what next? Well, the next is to choose one of the solutions or at least one part of the problem and apply the solution. Now, well, I'm aware of the safe distance guidelines, so 
even though people are holding hands, we are just using that as a metaphor here. Now, if problem solving puts us on the track towards goals, we also need to examine what's under the hood. So sometimes if the car is fluttering, we need to look at the engine. And this is where cognitive behavioral therapy is very helpful. It tells us what's going on under the hood, literally what's going on inside our minds when we are faced with difficulties. But as you can imagine, unlike a car, you can't change parts. There are no spare parts to be fitted. So we have to use our mind to work with the problems of the mind. This is a very simple uh, illustration of cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is actually not a lecture on cognitive behavioral therapy. So we'll just have a very brief overview. Uh, our thoughts, emotions, behaviors, body sensations are interlinked uh, as a whole experience. A cognitive behavioral therapist helps you break these down so that you can address these things individually. Uh, but in general, addressing any one of these changes the whole cycle of experiences that we are having. So going into more specific now, so I've given you a, a general framework of problem solving. Let's go into specific there. So right now in the situation that we are finding ourselves, we are likely to face two big areas of emotions. One is anxiety and the second is low mood or depression. Now, these may be at a level of a diagnosable problem which requires treatment, or these may just be emotions which come and go. Either way, these are the signatures of these emotions. When people are anxious, they tend to try and reduce the anxiety, avoid, worry, etc. When people are suffering from low mood, the general tendency is to despair, withdraw. And none of these things are completely abnormal. Uh, but the issue is, if it becomes very excessive, they can prevent us from taking effective action. So recognizing the emotion and its impact is really important. And to do that, we have to ref reference back to the issue of meaning. What is most meaningful to us in these situations? And how are our emotions impacting us from acting on those things which are meaningful to us? Sometimes it's very hard for us to look outside of ourselves. So it would be useful to have someone who could coach you. Now, this could be a professional therapist, but this could equally be a wise friend or a family member. So these could be resources around you, or you could be a resource for someone else in helping them work through things. We'll just shift to some general problems, which I think are a common uh, uh, experience across the world just now. Uh, this may not be the most comprehensive list, but this certainly covers a, a good range of problems. Talking about worrying and uncertainty, when I was kind of looking at this visual, uh, which is about brain evolution, interestingly, uh, as I was trying to highlight how human brain has evolved, uh, the arrow pointed out to the brain and then pointed to the mouth as well. So what that means is animals uh, generally, except humans, don't think as much or have very primitive forms of thinking. So worrying is really a product of the brain being highly developed. It helps us solve problem. It helps us anticipate the future. But when worry gets fueled by excessive uncertainty, it actually takes over our lives and uh, prevents us from effective problem solving. Uh, and we are hoping to have another presentation on this uh, next week, which will go into much more details. So we can work very effectively with worrying. Uh, I think we need to just connect my battery, so I apologize for the interruption. back on. So uh, very often we start thinking of uh, worrying as 
thoughts. But in fact, worrying is a form of activity. And if we think of worrying as an activity, we have a choice of another activity, which is more effective. So for instance, if you're spending a lot of time worrying, there might be a way to engage with other things which are important in life. Perhaps calling a friend, uh, doing something which you might enjoy. This could be music, exercise. So you can choose to shift from one activity to another. Initially, when we talked about distancing, we were thinking about well, we were thinking about social distancing, but in fact, it's not really social distancing. It's about the physical distance to uh, uh, stop the virus from spreading. So distancing is not uh, a social issue. Distancing is more of a physical issue. So there are many reasons why social connections are important. Um, it is really important for our social rhythm. So when people are depressed and they tend to withdraw from people, it affects the 24 hour social rhythm that we have. Uh, there's also signs behind uh, social connections, our uh, health, even the style and uh, fashion that we follow can be influenced by our social connections. So even our second and third degree connections can be very influential. I'm just trying to make sure that the slide is getting shared. So one of the ways that we work on this issue is to help people take a stock of their interpersonal resources. This is commonly used across evidence-based psychological treatments. So this is the person and they have a range of people in their lives. So what we could do is help the person make a list of important people in their life and even people who they haven't seen in a long period of time. Sometimes just scrolling through your phone or media can give you this information. And then helping them reconnect with them has a remarkable effect on their mood. So this is something which we can use for ourselves. And I'm sure many of us are indeed doing that. And then there's the issue of routines. When we talk about routines, there are some really big myths to be busted. Routine is not something which happens automatically. You might decide uh, to follow a routine, but the motivation from the routine for following the routine actually comes from outside. So the first and foremost thing that we want to advise people is not to really blame themselves for not following a routine. In fact, it's good that you've taken the decision to follow a routine. Now rely on motivators outside of yourself. Simple things like changing your clothes, uh, in the morning helps you get into a different mindset uh, of a routine. Uh, making appointments with people is yet another routine. I often tell people uh, when I'm doing my consultation that actually they are helping me keep my routine. So people can help each other to keep their routines. So plant your motivators and drivers outside of yourself rather than relying on just the internal feeling of getting things done. So why routines? A uh, lot of research on our uh, biological rhythm shows that having routines actually help us have a sensible and healthy 24 hour cycle. Well, it also gets things done. Uh, and now that we have very few external cues of so people are uh, not working from their offices, right now that's what many of us are doing, uh, or uh, the usual travel and other cues which provide us with routine are not happening, we need to create external uh, signals for our own routines. So I've given you some examples how to do that and include people 
and external cues as much as you can in following your routines. Now, personal health has been uh, on top of people's minds. So as health services are shut down, how do you manage your personal health? The most interesting thing I've noticed uh, as being a healthcare provider, that even though health services have been shut down uh, in terms of face-to-face -face contacts, actually the access of healthcare to healthcare will paradoxically increase. You now have specialists visiting you by video or phone. This we couldn't have imagined just a few weeks ago uh, it, within the healthcare community, which tends to be very conservative, actually connecting with clients through video or phone is not uh, a largely or widely held notion. And perhaps companies like Snap Clarity have been providing that for a period of time, but that is certainly not routine. But now we have this availability growing rapidly across the world. So there are various reasons to think carefully about personal health. In day-to-day -day life, we take our health for granted, um, especially our basic health care. But right now, we have to think about it more carefully. Consider your dental health, for example. Dentists are all closed in many parts of the world. Uh, and actually, I'm paying more attention to flossing my teeth now than I ever did before. Uh, and all this actually makes healthcare interesting because now we have to have a checklist of various things, almost like um, your car maintenance. So personal health is also about getting organized. So I've had situations where people are running out of uh, prescriptions um, uh, or uh, they might had, have had a health plan uh, which they have uh, not been following for some time. So this is a good time to get your personal health plans on track. And there are lots and lots of advice lines uh, in many countries where you can call people who can give you health advice and these services have been available uh, for a period of time now. Health anxiety is another big uh, issue that we are seeing uh, in, the, in these times. So we are having presentations in emergency rooms where people are really anxious that they might have contracted uh, COVID-19. And we are in a difficult situation because why testing is not available everywhere. Uh, so the way we approach this is to help people find the right health information from trusted sites. So for instance, what are the actual risks of contracting COVID? There may be a case that people are vastly overestimating the risk, even though it's an illness with higher uh, rate of severity than normal flu, the actual risks may not be as high to an individual. The reason why we are taking these precautions is so we prevent the spread of virus uh, to people who are more vulnerable. So news is important and how many times have we found that we keep checking what's happening in the world with respect to COVID. And, and this activity can itself uh, become very unregulated and start interrupting our routines. So one way to think about this is to have a strategy. So what's the content that we want? Uh, of course, being informed is important. So where are the sites where we can get this kind of information? How often do we need to check the news? Uh, in, in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, things are not going to change radically in few hours. So perhaps setting ourselves with some sensible sort of frequency, maybe two or three times uh, a day to check news rather than uh, scrolling and scanning the internet uh, for uh, hours uh, or repeatedly throughout the day. And the news uh, obviously has to be based on science. So there's lots and lots of news, especially in some of the social media uh, sites, uh, which may just not be accurate. Uh, and as a group, if you're living with people who are close to you, it would be important to check how we are all accessing this news and what's the quality of the news that we are accessing. Fun is important. And here uh, I take the point that fun actually provides positive emotions. And again, that's a talk in itself that positive emotions are actually good for our health. It's, it's been linked to longevity. Um, and when we are under the influence of a positive emotion, like happiness, of course, uh, we tend to be more creative in our solution finding. 
we tend to relate better to people uh, when we are feeling positive. So this is why fun is really important. Uh, and uh, we are finding people being very creative in uh, finding outlets for fun, connecting to uh, the social media, or singing together across balconies. So there may be so many different ways to include fun and positive emotions in our life. Relationships have actually uh, uh, taken uh, a new turn now. Uh, even when we relate to people who are close to us, we are spending a lot more time uh, now uh, with people uh, around us. In general, uh, humans are social animals. Uh, and the reason for this is physically, we are far weaker than many of the hunting animals that uh, have come before us in evolution. But we have been really successful in surviving because we do things together. Uh, and there are positive benefits of relating to people. Uh, when we are treating people with depression, one of our key uh, approaches is to reconnect them with people uh, who are close to them and even people who they just know as acquaintances. And the rewards they get from this connection are very, very visibly uh, effective in improving their mood. Uh, so how do we get go around doing this? Uh, now we have to actually be more deliberate about this. So there's face time uh, and there's also space time. So it's actually been uh, my recent practice that I commonly check with my clients uh, about the space they live in and how many people there are. Is the house all in one floor or there are different floors and how do they find time to be together and time to be alone? So these things are some important consideration in planning our day because we are uh, very much homebound now. The science of sleep tells us a lot how to manage our sleep and this will also be another presentation. Our sleep drive is uh, actually regulated by two major forces. So there's a 24 hour force. So in a 24 hour cycle, uh, uh, we, have sleep and wake cycles. Uh, so for instance, uh, over the 24 hours, around say evening time, we automatically start feeling uh, sleepy. Uh, so that's a normal 24 hour cycle. Uh, the second cycle is sleep deprivation cycle. So in the uh, span of the day, we are not getting sleep. So we're getting progressively sleep deprived. So towards the end of the day, we feel the need for sleep. So these are two independent cycles and putting them on the in the same direction is really important. Uh, so for instance, if we do not have sleep routine, that affects the 24 hour cycles. Uh, if we nap during the day, that affects the sleep deprivation drive. So putting both the drives in the same direction is really important. And this is something which is becoming even more important to educate people. We also need to uh, harmonize our sleep cycle. So you can imagine in the same household, if people have different sleep cycles, that could actually cause a lot of interruption. So we need to work as a team to manage our sleep cycles together. Exercise is one of the single most important uh, intervention in general in healthcare, but also improves the quality of sleep. We are going to invite a parenting expert to give us more advice on parenting. But it's kind of in the last few years, we haven't been in a situation where parenting is more important across the world because no matter what the crisis is uh, in front of us, uh, our children will continue to develop. Uh, and it's also important for the parents' health. Uh, the education system is also trying to find out best ways to deliver uh, the goods that they were designed to deliver. So how do we manage parenting when there's social distancing and all the other constraints uh, that we have with uh, the coronavirus epidemic. So first and foremost, if we can think of parenting uh, in different segments, so we have very young children, uh, we have preteens, teens, and then we have older children. Each of these children, uh, it, it is, each of these groups have their own needs. And we need to find a way to give them good rationales as to what's going on. In fact, one of the things which has been crossing my mind that perhaps the school system 
uh, should have presentations for children at each level to inform them what we are facing collectively, uh, what's the definition of an epidemic, how it affects people. It would be a wonderful education in science and uh, society. As parents, we all have to take breaks too, because working from home, uh, living so closely together can put a lot of stress and strain. And if you are the leader of the ship, you need to have some time for yourself too. Uh, a lot of parenting requires negotiation and compromise. And many families are already finding time to have family meetings uh, on regular periods of time to decide on how they can work together in this situation, which at the moment doesn't seem to have a defined endpoint. There are many different things to cover uh, in the area of lifestyle, but it is significant for us now because we might have taken lifestyles for granted, but now with the, the constraints that we have, we have to find ways to continue this. One is that lifestyle tries with routine. Uh, lifestyle is actually a very important regulator of uh, health and uh, relationships because it brings people together. So how do we uh, actually practice lifestyle? These are some, some uh, uh, few pointers and people may just have more. So exercise is an important part of a healthy lifestyle that we know. Uh, but how do we work this out so that we are able as, to do this as a group, um, say in a family? that would be an important decision to make in terms of lifestyle. Exercise independently actually has been shown to lower depression and anxiety. And in fact, uh, in Canadian and in many other guidelines, exercise is included as one of the treatment of lower intensity of depression. Uh, so nutrition is not just about having a balanced diet now. Nutrition is also an activity that we uh, participate in together with other people. When we talk about meditation, uh, people think that somehow it's the kind of deep, thoughtless moment that we can arrive at through meditation, which is going to be very calming. My simple advice is that we don't have to become super meditators. So let's use meditation to suit the needs that we have now. So sometimes to break the cycle of worrying, and other times to just relax so that we are able to find some rest and peace. So there are many different styles of meditation and this is not uh, the presentation to cover today and we hope to organize another presentation on this we've covered a lot about uh, uh, social connections so going into hobbies and interests uh, these things uh, have taken a very creative term we see people uh, forming groups uh, to practice hobbies we see people taking up new hobbies which they had always wanted to take up before so how do we tie these things up uh, as, a, as a cohesive whole of uh, lifestyle? Work is often seen as source of stress. But in fact, when we look at literature closely, working is better for mental health than not working. Uh, and there is huge agreement on this uh, across research studies. Work is also important for financial uh, consideration. It could be meaningful and enjoyable as well. Uh, so work has many, many positive qualities which need to be highlighted now. So how do we manage work now that the space where we live and we, where we work is actually coming together? On one hand, it has huge advantages. On the other hand, the separation of work-life balance could be a challenge. Um, there may be also, and I'm very sensitive to the fact that there might be issues of people uh, being unemployed or their work hours being reduced. Um, we are lucky that uh, in Canada, we have uh, support from the government to help in these areas. Uh, we also notice now that people are doing more online courses to look at alternate careers. Uh, uh, I've been um, uh, help, uh, helping people connect with employment agencies who have been a wonderful uh, resource to help people uh, manage uh, finance, debt, uh, look at career planning or job coaching. So these are some of the ways in which even in our day-to-day -day, uh, life, 
we can start planning forward. Financial uh, is, is a stress, is a huge stress going through the society. And in some ways, the only way to deal with this is to become specific. So looking at the budget, taking stock regularly. Uh, there's never been a more important time, and I have to remind this to myself and people I work with, that we need to actually uh, develop a discipline to plan times to look at finances on a regular basis. And there's lots of external advice. The, ba the banks are extending uh, their help to give uh, advice to people. There are financial websites uh, and there are agencies which might help people manage the finance uh, better. And um, although it's kind of redundant to say we are becoming more focused on what we need uh, rather than what we want. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to make a very quick summary. And uh, first of all, I apologize for the disruption uh, with uh, my battery uh, failing. Uh, so I've tried to uh, present three different angles today. The first was uh, from logotherapy, which is Dr. Frankel's approach that when we are faced with intense and uh, almost um, unexplained suffering, it's still possible to find meaning. And the, the personal meaning derived through that suffering is the main driver to make changes in one's life. The second part I picked up from the area of problem solving therapy. And that talks about how improving our faith in our ability to face our problems and solve them is the central uh, key feature for success. So to meaning we attach uh, the self-confidence and self-faith in trying to face our problems. And within that field, we also looked at how to break problems down systematically and choose the most important ones to focus on. Uh, finally, we also uh, talked about how cognitive behavioral therapy looks at what goes on inside people's minds when they are getting stuck with uh, problems. And going into sp specific areas, we delved into how people can deal with a range of uh, problems which have arisen due to the rapid changes that we are facing. So we are hoping to organize more topics uh, in the coming few weeks. So next week's conversation will be dealing with worry and anxiety, uh, which is hugely fueled by uncertainty. And we look forward to have you in that conversation next week. Here's another uh, list of topics uh, just underneath that. We are hoping to cover sleep, eating, parenting, routines, habits, um, women's mental health uh, and several other topics, but we would really welcome your comments on what you would like to hear from us. So this is a time for question and answer, and I'm going to ask my colleague Bonnie to actually pick up on the questions and answers which have been coming through to us, and we'll try to handle them jointly. Thank you. Everyone's being so quiet. <laughs> Any questions from anyone? I'm gonna ask a question, Dr. Rao. Can you explain um, the thought that it might be okay to find something hard to do. Is hard okay? Is hard okay. <laughs> uh, which part of the presentation uh, struck you as finding something hard to do is okay or not? Well, I think that 
you know what, this is unprecedented times. So what we're doing is foreign. So sometimes it feels hard. Does that mean that we won't succeed or is just hard a, a way that we can accept that it's hard, but I can still do it? That's a good point. And that speaks to uh, two things that, uh, actually three things that uh, we've discussed. One is, even if something is hard, if it's, some, if, if it's something which is meaningful to a person, then certainly it's worth the effort to begin with. Uh, hard things can be broken down. So when we think of things as one whole, they look very big. But if you break them down, they can be uh, more manageable. Uh, and the third thing is more from the cognitive behavioral therapy tradition, which is when we say something is hard, what's the thought behind it? I mean, why is it that we are seeing that as hard? Uh, and uh, within the same tradition, there's also uh, the issue of modeling, that uh, if we find something hard, there are other people who may have attempted those, and they can be like our role models uh, to work on hard things. Um, and finally, uh, there is also a sense of achievement which comes out of working on hard things, which can be reinforcing itself. Thank you. I'm just getting reading the comments. I'm hoping that people can hear me. Um, if not, please send me another message because my mic is on, but me if it's not resolved itself. I'm looking at our questions here. Uh, there is a question here on helping, you know, for, for employers, on the, you know, the thought on how best they could help their staff or where to start with a staff approach. So for employers, uh, as in, okay, so the, <clears throat> obviously this is a question and I'm going to try to answer the question from more mental health perspective because mm -hmm. uh, there might be so many different ways uh, on answering this question. So. Uh, I think employers, uh, and this is a good time where in general, because there's a shared um, shared issue and a problem. So there is kind of um, no difference between the employer and the staff in that sense. Everybody's facing the same problem. I think the employers need to probably uh, show sensitivity. And, and that's kind of still very abstract. What I mean specifically is they might want to see how they can help the staff get through this as as a crew and then go down to being more specific so what are the challenges so for instance um, there might be challenges which are special to single parents for example so how can the employers actually support people which ha who have special needs or challenges um, are there ways in which uh, they can give them good information uh, about uh, their healthcare needs. Um, can they set up uh, systems uh, to help people um, get advice and support um, for their mental health? Uh, and I know that some, some programs uh, who are working with SNAP Clarity, they have this kind of system where they uh, actually um, have a subscription, so they are uh, available um, to provide coaching and guidance to, to people. So if employers have that sort of service where they are uh, linked with uh, programs which can provide mental health support, that would be ideal. Um, there are EAP programs which can help people too. Uh, and if uh, members have uh, insurance or other benefits, they can actually be encouraged to use them. Uh, so these are some of the ways I'm thinking of in terms of the mental health perspective for the employers. Thank you. This is another very relevant topic is, you know, someone that's um, struggling with addiction and having to self-isolate and the, the challenge that they would be facing. Yeah, this is very relevant. Uh, and I did have in mind whether I should um, uh, include this as a topic or not. Uh, so I'm glad uh, because it's kind of a, a wide field uh, in itself. Um, uh, interestingly, um, Certainly, uh, with the legalization of cannabis in, in Canada, there's actually a sudden increase in demand. So people are using uh, more now, uh, that's for sure. Um, 
and uh, where also very interestingly, it's actually uh, the wine shops in Canada open uh, are open as essential services, I suppose. Uh, so how do people manage addictions? The one advice I have to say to people that the addiction services are not closed. They are still open. So when I'm dealing with my clients, uh, I'm actually encouraging them uh, and I'm encouraging by telling them that in fact, they, they might even be more flexible. You might be able to get your uh, addiction group or counselor uh, uh, straight to the phone. So I'm encouraging them to actually get in touch with addiction services as early as possible uh, rather than focusing on trying on their own. So that would be my big uh, advice to not leave it too late. There are a number of other things to, do, to be done, but this would be the most important. Perfect few more um this is this this will reflect on our on our quick thought on sleep but uh, how do you any any thoughts on how people that work night shift it's a very good uh, question mm -hmm. but uh, uh for people um i deal with this problem a lot actually um uh, if if you have a certain condition like a mood disorder like bipolar disorder it becomes really hard because in general uh, managing mood is linked with sleep cycles so people who have night shifts my advice would be to at least keep the shifts uh, with the same regularity if the shift hours keep changing then the sleep times keep changing so if you happen to be in a job which is night shifts is there a way uh, to negotiate regular hours within that shift and uh, I, i've sometimes worked with employers to help people find that regular hours based on health. So if you do have a specific health need, like a mood disorder, you can ask for support through your doctor to have regular shifts. Uh, but in general, for all of us, it's, it's important to have a regular routine for sleep. So we'd encourage that, yeah. And if you are able to find something which would work in the daytime, that's ideal. This is also something that some a lot of people would be living, my mother included. So um, I think of her often. Advice for someone um, self isolating that lives by themselves. Uh, so own. yeah, yeah. This this uh, uh, yeah. This mm -hmm. is an excellent uh, situation. I think a lot of references I made was about families and people, but there are people who are alone. So my advice to people who are living alone is uh, number one who were the people in their life or who are the people in their life even though they are living alone. So if you remember uh, that visual which showed a um, cartoon of a person uh, with figures or, uh, with arrows around them. So my first advice would be to make a list or inventory and actually uh, when I'm working with clients uh, and I've worked with a lot of clients who've been depressed and living alone and uh, pushing them to make that list for themselves makes a huge difference. And then uh, being uh, systematic in connecting with the people in that list. And sometimes we work together in when we're doing cognitive behavior therapy that we choose at least say three people to contact this week. Uh, uh, or uh, how do we have a regularity of contact either through phone, social media, uh, there have been occasions where I've worked with people where just the contact with social media was a good starting point for them to get reconnected with people. Thank you. We're still good for time, I think. Yeah, we've got a couple more minutes yeah. and we don't, we won't stop if the questions keep coming. This is exactly what we're here for. So we're grateful to help. So please continue to ask. This is one from, and in our therapeutic world, we, you know, it's the kind of that piece of any tips for people that are quite high achieving or that type A personality that need to still continue to do everything really, really well with the limitations of the pandemic. Okay. Um, so um, type A personality, the, the reason I'm <laughs> reflecting on it because I'm yeah. reflecting, reflecting mentally on how much the type A personality research has been replicated. I know, and I knew that's uh, a big question for you. Yes, because yeah, we yes. always want to go to uh, science. Yes. Yeah, so how much is, but I, I take it that you're talking about people who uh, like to be uh, uh, driven, achieve things. Uh, you know, uh, 
there's a term in Britain called courses for horses, which means that, you know, each do their own, uh, own style. So in working with such people, in fact, there are some um, advantages in, in, its, in its own way for them. So uh, if they have a need to achieve uh, and do things well, they can shift that need to how do I organize my life? How do I organize my routine? How do I organize my connections with, uh, with people? Um, how do I uh, organize my home? People are taking things like, uh, you know, uh, sorting out the garage or their living room um, uh, or the cupboard. So there, there are many, many small achievement tasks which they can place around their life and work through that. And then there's that responsibility piece of feeling like you need to take care of others. Um, that could certainly play a part in, in someone worrying about something that they can't, they can't manage or control. Yeah. So the, the responsibility piece is something which I feel has become very important. In fact, I'm noticing that people are not so self-centered, even like, uh, even in the midst of uh, real crisis and depression and anxiety, I'm finding that people are showing more other centeredness. And yes, for somebody who is very driven, they can take that as a project to um, help people in their own way from distance. That could be yet another way. But when you said about uh, that, were we take referring to ty in general or were you referring? A little bit this? of both. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, just a quick, yeah, a quick touch point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I've seen an interesting phenomena when I'm having um, sessions with clients. This is the first time in my entire career people ask me how I'm doing. And they, they end the session by asking me to look after myself, which is, which is, I feel very grateful for that. But I'm noticing that, you know, people have their own difficulties, but they are also looking out for other people. Mm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, I think we got to the questions, all the questions so far. Um, and I encourage everyone to continue to send your questions and I will continue to respond. You know what? And we're going to be doing this weekly. So we're here for you. It takes a community and we're grateful to be able to do this for you. So as questions keep coming, write them down and um, we're always going to be available to answer them. If it's not right now, this is another one here. Okay, yeah, we keep going as questions come. Mm -hmm. I don't. Hello. Oh, somebody says hi. Hi from Halifax. Well, hi to if we, you. Folks if we in could Halifax. bottle some Halifax air in a jar and and distribute that, I think we'd all um, it would all make us feel better. Um, so. Okay, no question, just hi. I'm gonna pull a little bit. So for me, as you teach me through my learning of CBT, I really like the way you, you explain self-efficacy. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, when we look at uh, literature uh, and we look at long-term studies um, and studies across different fields like achievements uh, oriented fields like sports, music, education, career, um, the one factor which seems to cut across is uh, self-efficacy, which is um, literally, if we just want to put it in um, language which we can all understand and identify, is faith in one's uh, ability to take up life's challenges or the challenge they are faced with. Um, it's not the actual ability so it's not the actual ability or talent but the belief in oneself and that seems to be really important mm -hmm. um, there are more there's more research into self-efficacy um, one is to show that people who solve problems uh, well they seem to have a lot of self-efficacy in my own practice i've seen that uh, when people are getting treatment for depression even when the depression improves if the self-efficacy doesn't improve, they have difficulty in getting back to life. So a lot of the emphasis could be not just being undepressed, but being able to face the challenges of one's life. Uh, um, 
th there's even more interesting research on self-efficacy that there may be something very general about it, but there may be something very specific about it. So we may not have the same kind of self-efficacy beliefs in all areas. In so, uh, so we may be better in some areas and you know less so in other areas because we can't we can't be we can't have strong self-belief in everything um, in, in every ability. Um, so there's so there's work-related uh, self-efficacy, for example, as a as a specific uh, thing to. Uh, we, we've been having these questions about uh, how do we manage work and in terms of work and mental health. So yeah, so there are, there's the general self-efficacy and there are specific types of self-efficacy applying to different areas in life. Okay. Okay. I don't have okay. any other questions currently. A lot of people thanking us, which is, we thank you. It's our yeah. privilege to do this for you. Yeah, we thank you. And I think this was our um, first setup and uh, we are all working remotely. So getting it to pull together, I'm incredibly grateful to the Snap Clarity team who worked over Easter uh, weekend to make this uh, happen. And hopefully next time we'll have less uh, technical glitches from my end. You were covered very well. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, I guess um, we could um, not say goodbye, but see you later. And yes. uh, hopefully, yes, we'll see you same time, same place next Tuesday, 7 yes. to 8. And we'll talk a little bit more about worrying. And I think I'm going to leave it with worrying. What I've learned to do is... I see worrying like a task. So I clean my house, I go to work, I worry, but I then know that I can, my work day ends, I can stop cleaning when I feel like it. So I'm like, I identify I'm worrying, I don't wanna worry, what can I do to not worry? So I process it just as simple as a task of I just don't feel like doing this anymore. Yeah, so Bonnie, hold that thought, more <laughs> conversation on that next week. Take it up next week, okay, thank you everyone. Stay safe and yeah. well. Stay safe folks. Good evening. Mm -hmm.